Uh, Margot exemplified the spirit of the early days of software design development. She was always ready to openly share ideas and uh, jam with you, jam with anyone, and or help make connections to others who uh, might be good people to know. And her circle of connections was huge. Uh, Self-interest was um, less important than the ultimate goal of doing something wonderful for kids. Um, this is, I think this is her husband, Roger. And um, she was famous for her uh, you should meet parties where everyone who came was given a piece of paper with three names of uh, three people that she thought you should meet. And then you kind of wandered out into the crowd uh, talking to little groups and finding the people that were on your list. And they were always really cool people. I mean, it was like if we were going to meet with each other at a party, you know, I could think of it would be fun to meet any one of you here. And that's what she was doing. She was always hooking people up. In fact, somebody was telling me that um, she always knew where the work was. And so people would call her and say, I need a job. And she, she'd say, oh, they're hiring her, they're hiring her. Um, I had met her a few times, but the first time I got to know her was when I asked her to consult with me at, at, on Broderbund's math workshop title that I was I was designing. It's a great title. And uh, we met at her home and I walked into her living room and it was full of several small kid height tables and everyone had a pile of really cool geometric manipulables on it. And she's talking to me and I was just like I was like Darren I was totally distracted going, oh, I just want to sit down and play here for a while, you know, can I play with this one? You know, uh, I had, you know, it was like this was her life. She was bringing kids into her home as well as into the schools and just playing with all these cool math concepts. And um, she had an interesting career path. For 15 years she was a, a K-12 mathematics teacher. And she taught everything from, from the youngest kids to the, all the way up through uh, the top of the, to the 12th grade, including um, adult classes. And she had one uh, at the Berkeley Adult School called Math Without Fear, and then she had a, a class, she even wrote a special textbook for uh, Math for the Blind Students class, and then had that turned into Braille. So she was like, she was into math, sure you can learn it, let me help you. Uh, she was always there to do it. And, um, but in 1987, in the, the early days of software, she was hired as an educator at the then cutting edge um, Apple Multimedia Group and uh, the lab uh, there she experimented researched and developed early industry prototypes demonstrating unique ways to interact with images to understand difficult concepts in math and science basically using a laser disc driven by hypercard uh, so you know it was early and um, this is a, a little uh, just a, a we found a few strange clips uh, this one's called the conservation of angular momentum, and um, I'm sorry for the bar across the middle of it. It's talking to kids. This is playground physics. Laser disc. Uh, run by a Mac Plus. <laughs> So it's just a little, a little interesting piece there, and uh, it was hard to find much of her because she was not somebody who was always in the forefront. I mean, she spoke at the Game Developers Conference. She was interviewed in Game of Sutra um, magazine and uh, a lot of other places, but she was just not somebody who was out in the forefront. She was always sort of in the back, making connections, helping everybody. And she was really interested in uh, offering children different perspectives to help facilitate learning. Um, she said, technology can allow us to get a unique point of view. For example, it can also allow us to speed up or slow down time, which lets us see things 
we can't see from our normal human perspectives. And a lot of the stuff that was in the multimedia disc was like that. It had, you know, bullets going through eggs and uh, waves coming in fast and moving things around. So you always had a different way of looking at things. And um, here's another clip. We made 16 activities, and each one a child would play with for, uh, you know, anywhere from 20 minutes to an hour. And the teacher would use it to um, help instruct the class. Our idea was this to make a sample of something that circa 1988, I'm guessing. But they could also be used by kids. Black and white maps. We've chosen playground physics here. This is one of the pieces, and it has several parts. On the opening screen, we can go find out about this activity if we want more information. We could see other things that are related. We could return or we could start. So we will start. Build an hybrid In this card. activity, we have three parts. We have a teeter-totter piece um, and two merry-go-round pieces. The first one I'll show you is rolling a ball on a merry-go-round. This is a piece in which we want to think about how we could use the technology to explain some difficult concepts. Here we have an opening card that explains the idea. And then we'll start. So this is a frame to reference problem. It asks you what happens when you try to roll a straight ball on a merry-go-round. And when we look at the merry-go-round, here's a Lou rolling the ball to Heather. These are students from Berkeley High that we film. And he rolls the ball. And something funny happens to it. Now what we get is a, a second point of view. And I'm going to play that and we'll see if the ball seems to behave differently. So the question is, does that ball seem to be moving sort of in a straight line or in a curved path? Um, many people see it in different ways. And what we did is we used the Macintosh to try and trace the path of the ball. So as I click on the ball on the Macintosh, the video follows. And you can actually see the way the ball is moving. Most people we showed this to felt that the ball was moving in a um, counterclockwise arc. And yet, we see from the top view that it seems to be moving in more or less of a straight line. So this was that piece about allowing kids to look at things from different point of views. And this is before Apple had color monitors. I mean, this is back in the early days of black and white pixel dots. And uh, so they were really pushing what they could do. Um, so, um, so she went on to work as an interactive design consultant uh, over the years with Stanford Research uh, Institute, SRI in Palo Alto, Hasbro, Harrison Fox, Broderbun, Britannia School, uh, New Tech Networks, Scholastic Education, Math Solutions, Pearson Education uh, for many years, and then many more companies. She just kind of was a gadfly who was often consulting and then would go work for somebody for three or four years. She worked with a lot of groups in outreach programs, uh, working with kids uh, who had uh, not a lot of access to computers. And, um, and then she... Um, I, you know, often I talk about inventive older software titles, uh, long out of print, but with great ideas and execution. And several of uh, Margot's products fall into this category, uh, along with the brilliant uh, Bob Mole uh, from MIT, who she created Countdown, and a couple other games I'll show you. And these were published by Aline's company. You can't see it over here on the corner, but it says uh, Voyager on the side. So this is the days of independent publishers where Two people could take a product they built with HyperCard and, and a little bit of, or at least a very early CD-ROM. And um, this was a, a game that was about uh, teaching younger kids how to estimate. And Margot believed that ideas come from playing around. Um, hopefully we can create environments in which kids can play around with concepts. And the environment may not actually teach the concept, but by playing around, the kid gets an intuitive sense of the idea such that when a teacher brings it up, the child has already got it. And um, in an interview uh, with Gama Sutra magazine, um, she shared this story. She says, one of our first examples of interacting with images was a simple little game of a jar of marbles, which is where the 
Countdown came from. We shot a picture of a jar of 250 marbles. Then we took one marble out and shot another picture of 249. Removing one at a time, we took pictures all the way down until the jar was empty. We put the pictures on the video disc and made a little estimating game. Guess how many marbles and the image would count down your guess. And you'd probably find uh, many marbles still in the jar so you could make another guess. Uh, a first grade teacher told us that she used this in her class as an activity station and later in the year when she got to her estimating unit she gathered the kids around and started talking about the concept of estimating. Finally, one of the kids said, oh, it's like those marbles. And suddenly like lightning, the whole class got it because they'd been playing with the images of marbles that whole year. And the teacher was amazed because rather than spending a week on estimating, she only had to spend two days and felt the kids understood it better than if she had, they had in the previous years. And, um, uh, another one of their products was Planetary Taxi. And um, it's an experiential game that helped kids have a different perspective on planetary attributes, including relative distances. And uh, this was another one um, from Voyager. And Margot was always asking, well, what can the technology add? Because we were still in the early days of technology, and it wasn't actually clear, and people were a little scared of technology. And... Um, um, Margo said, um, kids in a very short time have a strong impression that those inner planets are really close and the outer planets are really far away. So this is something you never really get from making those planet models in the fourth grade. Now, what is the relative distance? Um, in, a Gamma Sutra, in that same Gamma Sutra interview, which was called from um, Life After Twitch, Life After Twitch um, a high school physics teacher told us, she says, that he, spent, he spends a week um, creating a scale model of the solar system out on the football field. He has the kids do all the calculations, and then if the sun is the size of a grapefruit, then they discover that Pluto is the size of a grain of salt and is the football length away. And the kids make all the calculations, and then they go out and do it. That takes a week. Um, and then, um, let's see. So she turned one week of study into a powerful and interactive multimedia and I think I can play. Robert Mole and Margot Nanny have created a great new taxi game to help kids learn about the solar system using a scaled down model to more easily conceptualize the sizes of the planets and the distances between them. Jupiter. Mars. In this scale model, the sun has been shrunk to the size of an eight foot balloon. At this scale, it is almost six and a half miles from the sun to the outermost planet, Pluto. The Earth has shrunk to the size of a cherry tomato. Jupiter has shrunk to the size of a pumpkin. Pluto has shrunk to the size of a teeny tiny peanut. Um, I think I have these. Are, we, were, we were surprised that Barbara did a lot of work pulling these kind of obscure clips off of YouTube and other places. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main um, activities is to pick up passengers and take them where they ask to go. And uh, however, they don't tell exactly where to go. They give you information about the location, and you have to figure out where that is. I'm raising my prize pig Wilbur for 4-H Club, and I want him to win first place as the heaviest pig ever. He already would weigh a hundred pounds on Earth, but that's not enough. So I'm thinking, why not get Wilbur weighed on another planet? Take me to the planet where Wilbur will weigh the most. So we just put a little bit in there. So they're always giving you problems. It's, it's, oh, it keeps it's going. Now, now it's actually showing. Oh, it's showing. How much something weighs depends on how strong gravity is. So they just selected the hint. Oh, there's a Choosing a planet, and then over there they're selecting gravity. It's kind of a grainy video. Okay, so which planet do we want to go to? Jupiter. Jupiter, right. Now that's what I call a prize winning 
white. So, and again, this is pretty early days of CD-ROM, um, but done by a, a small development team. Um, let's see, another uh, game that they did was they joined uh, forces with Scott Kim, uh, who's spoken here before, and um, right. Scott is, um, is another math geek. Um, he's an amazing guy. He was the puzzle master at Sega for some years, and uh, they made this product, Top Secret Decoder. Scott's a, a kind of guy that the first time I met him, I was sitting across the table from him. He took a napkin and he wrote my name, and my name's long, Mark Schlichting, right? And he holds it up to me, and then you turn it upside down, and it says Mark Schlichting. <laughs> then you turn it upside down, and it says Mark Schlichting. And it was like, he's a, he could think about how everything looked transposed, and he figured out ways to write things so that they could do that. Just a really amazing person. And um, so this is a, a tool for coding and deciphering secret messages. And uh, we couldn't find very many examples. Um, here's one um, where, um, oh, let's see, on. this was, it uses a simple cipher uh, based on the first letter of the object. So heart is an H. An envelope is an E, a ring is an R, so forth. And it says, here, and we just found this on, the, on, on, the, on Google. Here is a story about Johnny Rotten. The king is dead. <laughs> so, it's like, surprised. Me. We were really surprised that that's what it was. But, um, I know. But the, the, a lot of the, the puzzles were really quite interesting. Sometimes you had to fold them in half and hold them up to the light to see what they were. Some of them used uh, different kinds of code, and, um, but there was a whole bunch of different ones. Here was another one where you cut it in half and then you um, fold it over, and when you slide it, um, all of a sudden the words show up because the interrupt takes away the pieces that you don't want to see, and then your mind lets you see what the image is. So it was a pretty interesting, simple product but it was a lot of fun to play with and it was a lot of fun. In my office, people were standing for a while, even though it wasn't one of our products, but we were always, this, I think this was a Mifflin product, they were sending pieces back and forth in all directions. We had a lot of fun with it. The adults had as much fun with the kids did. Um, and then when, um, when I was asked to um, spend the task of designing a different kind of math title, I reached out and talked with several of my math geek friends and, because I wanted to do I wanted to do math that had a totally new approach to the, than what we've been doing. And um, I didn't think that, you know, math was always taught separately from all the other disciplines. And I thought, well, art and math and all of that, should, they all kind of interchange with each other. So uh, in this game that we put together, and this is a pretty simple example, you, um, you're given a, uh, this is all about fractions, and you're given the crease and error rod up there with the one that says one half and one half. And you're supposed to cut that up uh, into the bar that's grayed out until you get the, the numbers, the, the colors that are at the bottom. And there's a, a cut it button and a glue it button and a weld it button. So you, you would do all these operations. You'd hold it up there and tell it what to cut. So you would cut and glue it and put all the pieces together. And then when you put it down at the bottom, it would, if it was the right one, it would play across there and it would play a rhythm because fractions are all math, they're all musical. So, you know, this one go, would go boom, 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 boom. And, and then it would loop and then it would play music and our character, uh, Algebird, would dance along to it. And this, and they really, it was amazing because when we were testing this, we had a girl, one of the first kids who tested it, she's playing and she goes, oh, one six. The one of six pieces. She turns around and talks to us in the testing, and we went, yes. You know, it's like, it was such a great moment. And uh, just one other interesting, but this is the sort of thing, is coming at it from a different perspective, where you actually was a manipulable that you could cut and glue and put it together. And we had an interesting problem here where um, we had a lot of really nice, great puzzles, amazing puzzles. And we had the three buttons, the green, the orange, and the red. And one was um, easy and one was medium and one was hard. And when we were testing, uh, we found that um, a lot of kids didn't want to be seen playing the easy level because it was the baby level and 
they wanted to be doing the hard level, even though was, sometimes they were pretty hard. So we changed it so that the first button was hard, the second button was super hard, and the third button was mega hard. <laughs> and then it was okay to play the first button because it was a hard level. Mm -hmm. So it was amazing how just renaming them changed how they wanted to play with so them. So before you take that slide away, I just want you to know that uh, we, I was working at High School Educational Research Foundation in Ypsilanti. I took this title to um, uh, Mississippi. I was using it with all the head start, uh, all the follow throughs, natural follow throughs, K to three, and it was a hit. This was the slice fractions of the day. Yeah. This is this, and I'm I, I'm sure you made a lot of money from this title. Yeah, none, but that's like that's okay with that. like like silly <laughs> silly money. Yeah, all right. But it was fun. We had a fun, and it was an, you know it's as anyone knows, working inside companies is always an interesting problem. Where what I designed it was the first time I wasn't in control of the, of the production of it, and so it turned they dropped things out of it. I had these characters that would run around, numbers would run around and bump into each other and become a different number. And a lot of kind of fun stuff. And the guy who was the art director took it all out. And five years later, he came to me and apologized and said, you were right, you know, <laughs> that's actually to put all that stuff back in. But I went to, you know, when I was having a problem, when I wanted to do different math, Margaret was one of the people I turned to and I think that's the way it was for a lot of other people. So. Um, before Margot died, her husband organized a gratitude party to help celebrate her life and her work and allowed her friends to share their appreciation of her uh, while she was still alive. And more than 60 people attended, Anne McCormick and Janine Heron, who has been here many times, and a lot, of, a lot of other early software people. It was amazing. People who started all these companies were all there for this big party, and they all had amazing stories about Margot and hooking people up. And, would, uh, you know, and she was there to enjoy it. She was. She had a problem where um, she was losing um, a lot of her uh, cognitive abilities. And, uh, but she could walk, and walking helped her. So she hiked up here. After she, this is after she was getting sick. It um, was uh, 64 flights of stairs um, by, their own, by their watch, you know, following the steps. But she's taught so many of us a great deal and was always a, f a lot of fun, and she was really a kind of a true unsung hero that almost nobody knows about except those of us who kind of jammed with her. So I'm happy to come in and uh, show products that, that uh, Aline sold and, and, and that you like too. So anyway, that's my tribute to Anne and uh, Man, Marvin Annie. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> so we, can, we can really learn a lot from the past and uh, Margot had a lot to teach us and one of the things she said here at Asilomar, when she came out for the only time she ever came to a Duster Magic was like the second year, I think we had this panel, and there she was. And um, she said, and I, I added the video, and I, whenever a really great quote came out, I try to highlight it. And this is just where the, the thing stopped. Where, what could the new media do that we couldn't do in other ways? And uh, that was really the question that she was always thinking about. And I think that's the same question we have and we'll always have is like, you know, this is smart speakers. What can we do that we could never do? And so that we're living, we're the transitional generation. So we're sort of lucky in a way and we can ask these questions. I love that thing that she did with the carousel and using the Mac to click and just thinking that you couldn't do that. Before. And it was, there was more of that and the kids were just going, whoa, you know, they were, they were mind blown. You could, you could feel how much they were enjoying it. Yeah. And it wasn't, it was just sort of a random thing they just happened to video on. Yeah. And she, I, I met her here, I actually met her here 18 years ago. At, she, they had a math conference. They sell at the, North, the Northern California math conference. So imagine this whole place just filled with math teachers. <laughs> and Margo and a couple other people, they, they set up a tech section of it that they ran within this big one. So I would come, this was like when I was first releasing the CD ROMs. And literally the first time I met Margo was, you got to meet. Yeah. <laughs> and she was just this very generous, hooked me up with everybody. And what happened was, that first night, she was like, she actually gathered maybe six or seven math teachers and a couple of bottles of wine in a room with me and my, my CD round that I was still working on. And we spent the night with these math teachers, like having a blast going through my stuff, giving me all this advice 
depend on, you know, what you should be doing to it. And that, like, became a tradition for, like, the next three years. I would come down and she had this, like, little mat party with all these pants and stuff. So, yeah, she, she has a, kind of the spirit of what we have going on here. That's exactly what I thought, too, yeah. She had, she had that spirit going on then. So, yeah, amazing person. So it's, it's, it's nice that we can do a little bit. And Barbara and I are going to head home and we want to thank all you all. It's great to see everybody. And uh, Look if we're here, here. It's a giant sandbag. Well, that's a big one.